Tez Walker has finally been declared immediately eligible by the NCAA ahead of North Carolina's matchup with Syracuse on Saturday. Oh, and the NCAA just couldn't help themselves taking one more shot at North Carolina for publicly holding them accountable. What's it all mean for North Carolina? We're going to get into it today. You are Locked On Tar Heels, your daily podcast on the UNC Tar Heels, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey there, it's Friday, October 6th, 2023. Welcome into the Locked On Tar Heels podcast, the only daily North Carolina show out there. I'm your host, Isaac Shade, and I want to thank you for making Locked On Tar Heels your first listen or watch every single day. Today's episode is brought to you by LinkedIn. These days, every new potential hire can feel like a high stakes wager for your small business. That's why LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the right people for your team faster and for free. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on college terms and conditions apply. Joining us today, making his first ever appearance on Locked on Tar Heels, Michael Coe, sports writer for WCHL. Michael, so great to have you. It's hilarious because we thought we were just going to be previewing Syracuse today. (laughs) And here uh, we get a bombshell dropped in our laps on Thursday. Uh, It's not LinkedIn Jobs that's just trying to find the right people for their team. The NCAA helped North Carolina finally find that last missing piece. And that's the news. Tez Walker is free and immediately eligible. We'll get into the logistics of it and other things, but right out of the gate, you get to join the show for your first time <laughs> with this massive thing going on. Michael, what, what are your immediate takeaways and reactions to this? Uh, well, first off, Isaac, thank you for having me on. I know we've known each other for a little bit. I feel like the last time I saw you in person was actually at the Final Four I in New so. Orleans. In yes. A year and a half ago. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think you need to have me on the show more often so we can have more absolute <laughs> nuclear uh, stories break the day of recording. Let's uh, do it. I'm all in. Yeah, absolutely. But uh, yeah, first impressions, I think I was surprised, I, I think, at the tone of the NCAA's statement about it. First of all, the NCAA likes to say they don't comment on individual cases, but yeah. then they comment on this individual case because it suits their pettiness, I guess, is probably the best word for it, saying, yeah, we're granting Tez Walker's eligibility, but we're not happy about it. We're not happy about how any of this went down. Uh, They made it seem like UNC withheld information that would have helped their own case, which doesn't quite make sense to me that UNC would do that on purpose, which I think is what the NCAA was intimating in their statement. So it just seems like an odd situation. Bubba Cunningham put out a statement where he said, you know, we had, you know, all the information available in August and, you know, this, the NCAA statement is not correct. But then Kevin Guskowitz comes out and he says, we had new information that was made available to us and we provided that to the NCAA. So somebody is lying here and we may never know who it is. It's a, it's a whole mess right now. Well, and that, that was the weird thing. Cause even within Chancellor Guskowitz's statement, it, it mentioned like we gave the NCAA everything we had. And then following that, he said what you talked about there, how it was like, but then we just received this new information that we passed along. And so I had that exact same thought. It's like somebody ain't telling the truth yeah. or you're finding ways to tell different versions of the same truth that just isn't lining up. And th- that's just what makes the whole thing really weird to me. And and I'm so, I'm with you. It was like the NCAA was so close to just doing the right thing. And it's like, it, it could have just stopped at, hey, Tez Walker's eligible and that's all it had to be. But they, it was like a child that just keeps going back to the dessert counter at Ryan's <laughs> buffet or something, just couldn't help themselves. They had to do it one more time. And so that's what prompts these statements back from Chancellor Guskowitz and Bubba Cunningham to say, listen, that that's not the deal here. And so, um, man, yeah, Michael, we've, uh, I even reached out to Jeremy Sharp, the SID for football to say, Hey, what are, what are we missing here? Because something is not lining up between these two statements from the NCAA. And all he was able to say back was the only thing I've been told is that the NCAA has not shared the basis for its decision. And that's a quote, uh, from an email that Jeremy sent back to me on Thursday. And so, ah, Michael, it, it's wild. And we're, we've got the, North Carolina attorney general sending letters. And it seems like 
McGovern, that too, was, don't forget. Yeah, it, like that seems like perhaps it was maybe what tipped um, the, the scales, perhaps, and is part of this new new information, whatever that is, of like, oh, actual potential legal action. Let me Here's just one quote from um, A.G. A. Stein's letter, and then we'll just get your response to that. Quote, despite all of these mitigating factors, Stein had laid out all the things that we all already know about not playing at NC Central, et cetera, et cetera. Despite all of these mitigating factors, the NCAA has denied Mr. Walker the opportunity to play football at Carolina this fall. Not only is that decision wrong, as a matter of common sense and decency, it is also likely unlawful, end quote. Michael, it seems to me that they're basically saying, hey, everything you're trying to do, NCAA, it just isn't going to hold up in court. So if you want to play that way, let's do it. But if not, go ahead and make him eligible. I mean, it, like, what do you make of all that? Yeah, when when the attorney general of the home state says this is against the law, it's almost certainly against the law. This is not, I was very struck by Stein's letter because when he said that he'd written a letter, I thought it was sort of in the style of Roy Cooper's letter from a couple months ago where it's like, hey, please please make him eligible. We'll ask very nicely. But no, Josh Stein was actually laying out the things that he would do to the NCAA if Tez Walker was not uh, declared eligible. And he said, you know, I will wait your response by September 29th. And he gets a response on October 5th, finally. Uh, so yeah, Josh Stein was very clearly putting his money where his mouth was. And uh, it seems like it helped. Uh, it, it was revealed today that a group of five local attorneys have been working with Tez Walker and with Josh Stein on his eligibility fight. Um, so yeah, Josh Stein certainly, I think, had a hand in this. Not the only hand, but he was a major help. I, I love your point there, Michael, that it's like Governor Cooper's letter. It was just kind of that nice, like, hey, I know you, Charlie Baker. This one was straight up like, a legal referendum kind of thing. I'm like, dude, I'm not trying to read all this legalese, but <laughs> these, this is shots fired clearly. No. Yeah, it was a playbook. Well said. Brilliant. Exactly. Legal playbook of how this is going to go. So you want to get into these waters? Let's go, NCAA. But from what I've seen recently, the NCAA has not held up well in court with, with everything we look at with antitrust stuff. And I don't think this would have either. Now, Co, here's the great news. While the NCAA lumped this bomb onto the end of it, trying to sideswipe Carolina, sling some more mud, let's lop that off. Because at the end of the day, the sentence is, Tez Walker is immediately eligible to play football. And that should have been the storyline, but let's make that the storyline now. Because regardless, what matters is that Tez Walker, the human being, this young man who came to North Carolina under the auspices that he would be able to play this year, finally can. And before we get to the, you know, what it means for Carolina as a team and their ceiling and things like that, what, like, let's just have a quick conversation about what this means for Tez Walker, the human. Yeah, it's great for him just one to get back to be, get back to doing what he loves playing football. That is why he came to Carolina. And also it's going to pay dividends for him. You would hope down the road that he actually got some tape. Uh, for NFL scouts catching footballs from Drake May as opposed to whoever would be playing quarterback for the Tar Heels next season. And he can actually bump up his stock again because a lot of people were looking at him as potentially a first-round draft pick. He was named to the Boletnikoff Award watch list. He was named first team all ACC in the preseason without ever playing a snap in the ACC coming from Kent State in the MAC. That, that is how high people were on this kid. And so if he can prove it out on the field, then yeah, he can absolutely play himself into the earlier rounds of the NFL draft, make himself a lot of money. So huge, huge 24 hours for Tez. It really, and man, that's all so well said. I mean, we're just thinking about the here and now of it, much less like you come here because Drake May, as you said, is the dude who's throwing you the ball. And that is going to do wonders, hopefully for his draft stock. Cannot wait to see it this Saturday. We finally get not only Nate McCollum, healthy and going, but also Tez Walker. And so, Co, that's the next thing. What, what does this mean for UNC ceiling? I mean, to me, just very simply, North Carolina just immediately got much, much better. It raises not only the ceiling to me, but also the floor. Yeah, absolutely. I think the theme through the first four games, other than Carolina winning, was that that sense of ah, if only they had that that guy who could take the t take the top off that Randy Moss receiver on the outside. You had good players there, Gavin Blackwell, JJ Jones, who had good games. But Tez Walker just 
sort of has he has that look about him that you know he's big he's tall he's fast he's got that combination like a randy moss not saying the tez walker is randy moss but i'm saying that he could be that <laughs> oh, kind we're of clipping that out michael <laughs> coe just said tez walker's no i'm just kidding <laughs> yeah and but it's it's another reason why i think people were looking at drake may's numbers and saying well they aren't as good as they could be it's because he doesn't have that threat on the outside last year josh downs was so good that he can mitigate some of that uh but now josh downs is gone you don't have that nfl talent in the slot right now and Antoine uh, not, Green to boot. Yeah, the and Antoine Green too. So absolutely, it just gives Drake May another weapon to another weapon to play with. And this isn't like fantasy football where you, you have to put one guy in the starting lineup lineup and take another guy out. You're just adding you, the rich get richer, basically. Exactly, and it's like in some ways I kind of hate it for JJ Jones because he just had this career game at Pitt, and I, I gotta imagine that it's gonna be the combination of Tez Walker, Nate McCollum, and probably Kobe Pesor. But uh, so I think that means fewer um, routes, fewer targets, fewer snaps for J.J. Jones. But hopefully he can find his way in. I mean, again, in a Drake May offense, you're going to have the opportunity for him to sling it around. And it's just one more mouth to feed. And I mean that in a healthy way. I think a lot of times one more mouth to feed uh, can be a bad thing. Like we think about it with basketball, getting guys in off the bench, uh, which is another sore spot for Carolina right now, obviously. But uh, w- in this regard, I think it can actually be a good thing because it's like, oh, good. Finally, Tez Walker's coming out. Oh, J.J. Jones is coming in. Cool. We got to deal with that. So all in all, I think a great thing for Carolina. And immediately it comes into play for Syracuse this weekend. They're going to have to deal with that. We're going to get to our Syracuse preview, the what to watch for coming up in just a second. But first, I need to tell you that this episode of Locked on Tar Heels is brought to you by LinkedIn. These days, every new potential hire can feel like a high-stakes wager for your small business. You want to be 100% certain that you have access to the best qualified candidates available. That's why you got to check out LinkedIn Jobs, which helps you find the right people for your team faster and for free. Real easy to create a free job post on LinkedIn Jobs, and then you just add your job in the purple hashtag hiring frame to your LinkedIn profile to spread the word that you're hiring. Simple tools like screening questions make it easy to focus on the candidates with just the right skill set and experience so you can quickly prioritize who you'd like to interview and ultimately hire. All of this is why small businesses rate LinkedIn Jobs number one in delivering quality hires versus the leading competitors. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the qualified candidates you want to talk to faster. Post your job for free right now at linkedin.com slash locked on college. Once again, linkedin.com slash locked on college to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. Want to remind you all that coming up today, Friday from 11 a.m. till noon Eastern, right here on Locked On Tar Heels and every other Locked On College YouTube page, is Locked On College Football Kickoff Live getting you ready for this weekend's college football action, including Carolina hosting Syracuse. And Michael Coe, that's where we go next. Folks, Michael Coe, WCHL, is joining us for the first time here today on Locked on Tar Heels. Great to have him on. It's been too long uh, coming, but here we are. We're making it happen right now. So just a quick few things getting ready for Syracuse, and then we're going to get into our W2, W4, our what to watch for, where we give you four things that we're looking out for in this game. And obviously there's two of us, so we're each going to give you two. So as a reminder, it's been a week off. Carolina is undefeated 4-0 for the first time since 1997 and just the second time since 1983. Showing my age a little bit here, 1983 was the year before I was born. That means it's been a minute. Syracuse also, I mean, great record. They're sitting at 4-1, just coming off a loss to Clemson. But those wins, Michael Coe, it's Colgate, Western Michigan at Purdue. That's pretty good. And Army. And so less, less tested than the Tar Heels, clearly, uh, given the schedule that the Tar Heels have played. And so there there is that in the Tar Heels' favor, a little bit more of a gauntlet. Obviously, Carolina hasn't played Clemson as as the Cuse have. Now, coming in the series history, interestingly enough, I would not have guessed this before I was reading back on all the numbers, is 3-3. to Both teams have won three games in this six-game series so far. Interestingly, Carolina, both teams are 1-2 and at home. So Tar Heels looking to take a series lead 4-3 and even things up where they're 2-2 two and two against Syracuse at home. Thankfully, it's not Greg Paulus, former Duke <laughs> point guard, taking the snaps for Syracuse in 
this game. So, Michael Co. Let's get into our what to watch for, the four things we are watching for in this game. Let's go back and forth. Give me your first one, and then I'll hop in with mine after that. Sure, Isaac. So it's it's easy to forget because this streak was actually broken last year, but UNC is coming off a bye week. And in MAC 2.0, that has been a bugaboo for the Tar Heels. They are 1-5 and five coming off their scheduled bye weeks in the second era of MAC round. This is not counting uh, unscheduled bye weeks like they had in 2020 due to COVID right. stoppages. Yes. And they started out 0-5. They finally broke that streak last year in November in their second bye week, or I believe it might have been October, when they beat Pittsburgh 42-24 yep. to in Keenan. And at, coming in, that was all anyone wanted to talk about. I was like, Mac, why, why are you guys so bad off bye weeks? And Mac Brown was clearly at the end of his rope getting all these questions. Like, I just want to talk about the ball game. Uh, so, yeah, it's something about ha having that extra week to prepare. It just – it bugged them. One of those games was the six overtime disaster in Blacksburg against Virginia Tech in his first year in 2019. Uh, another game was losing to number two Notre Dame in a game that was tied at the half in Keenan Stadium. That was in 2020, coming off one of their scheduled bye weeks. Uh, so it could be a team that's better than them or a team that they were better than. Like I think they were the better team than Virginia Tech in 2019. They still lost in six overtimes. Just weird things happening uh, when they have an extra week to prepare. I think Carolina is the better team than Syracuse. Uh, but something about bye weeks, man, they're, they're weird. And I, I definitely think that's something we have to watch. Yeah, it's almost like you, you start to overthink it or to try to put too much stuff in. It's like, just keep doing what has gotten you here. Let's add in Tez Walker into that now. But right. uh, no reason Carolina shouldn't and can't win this game and turn that one game winning streak into a two game streak and let's uh let's get this coming off a of bye week <laughs> thing flipped on its head. To that point about Tez Walker, my first thing to watch for is the question can Carolina avoid the distraction of Tez being available? It's funny, one of my things to watch for, my key points earlier in the season was it was like right after Carolina got the the next um denial of his eligibility and it was can Carolina avoid distraction the other way of like, ah, crud, we thought we thought this would be it. We thought this second appeal would do it and Tez would be available, but still no. And Carolina answered that one well. Is that the App State game? I'm trying to remember if it was App State or Minnesota now. I, I believe it was Minnesota because that was when they were chanting for Tez. Yes, uh, that's right. Tez yep. in the stands. And it was just like they, they were able to get past that, but now it's this other distraction of like, is Drake going to feel like he's got to force feed the ball to Tez? Or like there, there's just all these different things that come into play that you haven't really processed that um, how how is Tez going to react? How mm -hmm. is the rest of the team going to act? Is Coach Lindsey going to feel like he needs to call plays that get the ball in Tez's hands? I hope not. And it seemed like the way Tez has handled this all along, it feels like that won't be the case. I think mm -hmm. he's been level-headed he's been all in he's received nothing but pray like coach Chiswick came out on Thursday and had great praise for how he's helped prepare the team as part of the scout team these first four weeks and so th those things indicate to me that Tez's mind is going to be in the right spot it's actually more the rest of the team that I'm concerned about um, how this goes and honestly perhaps the biggest bugaboo in this is Syracuse we haven't talked about that can you imagine sitting up in Syracuse New York on Thursday <laughs> you're eating lunch and suddenly, as you said earlier, a preseason first team all ACC wide receiver is suddenly available that you thought that story was done and over. But no, Tez Walker will play. So I, I kind of hate it for Syracuse. It, it sucks for them, but obviously great news for Carolina. Yeah, Isaac, that, that brings up a good point. And it, it reminds me of something interesting that Mac Brown said after the South Carolina game when they were t still waiting. Tez's eligibility was still up in the air. And Mac said, yeah, you know, if Tez had played, obviously we wish he had played. But I think if he had played, he would not have played well because he would have been so just caught up in the moment of playing in Charlotte in his hometown. Uh, so it will be interesting to see. One of my friends texted me just joking. they like, watch Tez drop his first pass <laughs> in, in, in the game tomorrow. And uh, yeah, it's it'll be interesting. I wonder if they'll go with like the Marquise Williams flea flicker to Ryan Switzer, the first play in the Duke game a few years ago to get Tez Walker, that highlight play immediately. If I'm Syracuse, I'm putting all 11 defenders just <laughs> around Tez in a bubble because we know that's what they're going to try, right? They're going to try something. You're going to try something to fire the crowd up, fire the team up. 100%. Oh, I love it. That would be hilarious. Go Syracuse. I need to see it. Coach Babers, let's get that into action. Go. <laughs> what is your other thing that you're watching for in tomorrow's game? 
Yeah, it's first and second downs, Isaac. This is something that Mac has said has been a priority, is that UNC needs to be more efficient on first down and second down, both on offense and on defense. On offense, they're only converting, they're only making a first down on first or second downs roughly 26.1% of the time, about a quarter of the time. That's 115th in the country. Now, it looks okay because they are so good on third downs and fourth downs this season. They're in the top five. Uh, that's sort of masking a lot of those issues. But if those third down conversions start to dry up, UNC is not going to, they might not score a lot of points. Now, again, this is all without Tess Walker. So uh, yeah. UNC might be playing with a whole new offense on, against Syracuse. You never know. Uh, and then you look at defensively, they're even worse. They're giving up first downs on first or second downs 42.9% of the time. That is 128th in the country. Isaac, I would remind you, there are only 133 teams in the FBS. That's right. Uh, this yeah, I think it goes back to UNC's run defense maybe not being the stoutest. So if teams know that they can just run it up the gut for five or six yards every time, they're going to do that. We saw Minnesota do that until they absolutely had to throw, and then they got exposed. App State ran for a lot of yards. Really, South Carolina was the only opponent that struggled to rush against the Tar Heels, and I don't know if that says more about South Carolina or the Tar Heels. Uh, but yeah, first and second downs, those, those are the money downs, I think, for Carolina. They need to prove that they can – shore up on defense and be much more efficient on offense. Okay. So we'll be watching those first couple downs. As you said, Carolina has been winning third down. Well, I think I saw Lauren Brownlow a couple weeks ago, tweet something about it's almost like Drake may just loves third down. And so he kind of wants to tank first and second down so that uh, he can pick them all up on third down. But yeah, as you said, eventually there's going to be a regression to the mean and those third downs are going to dry up perhaps at a critical time that you cannot afford. And so first and second down, have to be it as you said we haven't seen it with tez that could be a game changer in those first early downs obviously only on the offensive side of the ball uh defense is gonna have to figure that out too my last thing i'm watching for is i love the diversity we've had from carolina in these first four games and so my question is who's it gonna be this time meaning game one against south carolina we had the british brooks game the cayman rucker game good grief against app state it was omari and hampton just running wild Game three, that was where Nate McCollum is finally healthy and back in. And Drake went to him early and often. And Drake himself had his best statistical numbers of the season. And then last game uh, against at Pitt, we talked about it earlier, but J.J. Jones had his career game. And then obviously it was the Elijah Huzzy game. That was, you know, so all of these different names, all four of the first games, who's it going to be this time around? Are we going to get a repeat? Is it going to be Tez Walker? Is it going to be somebody... We haven't thought about or expected who's going to make a big time play or have a big time day to help Carolina win. I think the diversity of capability here is part of what has allowed Carolina to excel and succeed thus far. And I'm just excited to wait to see who does it on Saturday in Keenan Stadium. Yeah, it's refreshing, isn't it, Isaac? It feels like last year it was really just the Team Nick, Drake, and Josh show basically every every night for the Tar Heels. And now they're winning games in different ways, which I think a lot of us who have watched Carolina, especially in the last few years, aren't used to. We're used to Carolina just scoring more points than the opponent by hook or by crook, you know, like 49-48 final. But now they're they're winning those ugly, you know, hand in the dirt games like against South Carolina or against Minnesota, where they can just, okay, be more physical than the opponent for a change. So yeah, I, I think Tez Walker is certainly on that short list of who's it gonna be. I think you can maybe see one of the tight ends, Bryson Nesbitt, Copenhaver, and Morales, just because all three of those guys are so talented. Yeah. And I think uh, uh, you could see a big game from Kobe Pesor as well. I mean, he's a guy who really benefited from Josh Downs missing those few games due to injury because that gave him some looks from Drake May that he otherwise wouldn't have gotten. And I think we might see that same effect on J.J. Jones with Tez Walker being out for the first four games. So, yeah, it'll it'll be interesting to see who steps up, especially on offense. I, I love that call on any of those three tight ends or Kobe because you got to imagine Nate Collum has quickly risen up the scouting chart. Tez Walker's obviously going to be there. And with all that attention drawn, man, that could pay major dividends for any of the three tight ends or Kobe or whoever that third receiver is or maybe even Omarion or, or, you know, British leaking out of the backfield. We'll have to wait and see what happens there. Either way, it's going to be electric and a lot of fun. Now, we've got some key matchups we want to throw at you all so you can be ready for that. Plus, of course, we got our game predictions, how we think this one's going to play out. We'll bring all that to you in just a second. 
But first, this episode of Locked on Tar Heels is brought to you by FanDuel. Snap into action this NFL season with FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Right now, new customers get $200 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place a $5 bet. That's $200 in bonus bets, win or lose. If you've been thinking about joining FanDuel, there's no better time to get in on the action than right now. The app is super easy to use. and You can bet on just about anything from spreads, over-unders, player props, and more. So visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and kick off the NFL season. FanDuel, official partner of the NFL. All right, Michael Coe and I have brought to you our four things we are watching for in the Carolina Syracuse game on Saturday in the W2, W4. And now we want to each bring to you a key matchup that we're watching in this game along with our game predictions. So Coe, why don't you start us off with this? Uh, what are what are two players or two position groups you're watching on Saturday? Yeah, I'll be really interested to see, Isaac, how the UNC run game fares against the Syracuse mm. run defense. I'll go back to a stat I referenced before, UNC's offense being not very good on first downs and second downs. That goes back to the fact that they have not run the ball very well, really, since the App State game. They didn't run it well against Minnesota. They didn't run it well against Pittsburgh. And Syracuse's rush defense is one of the best in the country. They're ranked 11th in success rate on defense against the rush at 30.8% defensive success rate on the rush. That is very, very good compared to Carolina's defensive success success rate on the rush. It's 45.7%. That is very not good. Uh, So if Carolina can establish a strong run game against a really physical Syracuse front, then they can bring that first uh, and second down percentage up. Like we said, regression to the mean, if they can get guys like British and Omarion and maybe even Caleb Hood uh, going on the ground, then that can milk the clock that can keep Syracuse's offense off the field. And also it takes some of the pressure off your all American quarterback and helps them get hit less often because Syracuse has a very good defensive front, as we said Mm. before. So, yeah, I, I think if if Carolina, excuse me, can establish the run, control the clock, which Mac Brown loves to do, he always mentions controlling the clock in his postgame press conferences, whether they did or didn't. Uh, that will help them incrementally, or excuse me, help them exponentially win the game. <laughs> yeah, and we, we got all the, the angst over that from the Carolina fan base down the stretch against Pittsburgh because the Tar Heels – We're trying to run the clock, but there was that incapability to do so. But all of it essentially because Pitt couldn't do anything offensively. And I think the big hope here is that you've got Willie Lampkin healthy enough in this week off. You've got, you know, your guards ready to go, help ready to go and clear things out for that running the game to pick back up. Obviously, hopefully Tez Walker takes some bodies out of the box, helps a little bit there as well. But uh, really need that good blocking from the offensive line to take care of business here. Now, uh, Co for mine, I'm kind of watching on the other side of the ball. I'm doing, you know, you mentioned maybe Syracuse puts all 11 guys on Tez Walker on that first play. I'm watching for Carolina's entire defensive unit against Syracuse quarterback Garrett Schrader. Now, the reason I'm not just saying the defensive front is because from, from numbers and looking at things with Syracuse, this is probably the big thing that the Tar Heels are going to have to do to shut down Syracuse is have help not only from the front, but from the secondary, getting Schrader on his butt when he takes off and runs the ball. Key game against Purdue. We mentioned that victory they had at Purdue. 195 yards and four touchdowns for Schrader. Michael Code, that was not his passing numbers. That was his <laughs> ground game. In fact, Vanilla Vic. He, <laughs> right, exactly. He ran for more than he threw for in that game. Now, Here's the weird thing. Outside of that Purdue matchup, he's never run for more than 50 yards in a game and hasn't had 300 passing yards this season. But as you mentioned earlier, as the story often goes with Carolina, we know this all too well that, of course, then that means that Carolina is going to be the first team all season that he throws for 300 yards against. This is an opportunity for Gene Chizik's unit to show that they are continuing to take steps forward as they've been doing this season don't be the first team to allow Schrader 300 passing yards don't be like Purdue and allow him to run wild North Carolina's defense has held three of their four opponents under 20 points this year and I know that you know what Pitt actually scored more than 20 but seven of those 24 were on that kickoff return so Carolina's defense held Pitt under 20 meaning 17 to South Carolina 13 to Minnesota And from the defense, again, 17 points to Pitt. For reference, last year, 
Carolina only held one team, Virginia Tech, under 20 <laughs> points. And they're trying to do it to their fourth team in the first five games this year. I want to see more of that, Michael Coe. So all these things said are what to watch for, what we're watching out for, these key matchups. FanDuel, the official betting partner of Locked On, has this game. Carolina favored by 9.5 points with an over-under of 59.5. Let's each make a prediction on how we think this is going to play out. Yeah, Isaac, I, I think this is going to be more of a low-scoring game just because of how Syracuse operates. As you said, they are a rush-heavy offense. Even when they are passing the ball, they are rushing the ball, as Garrett Schrader has shown. So I think this is going to be more of a low-possession game. Ball control is going to be critical. Limiting turnovers for the Carolina offense is going to be absolutely key. You do not want to give the Orange offense a short field. So I'll go, I'll go 27-13 Tar Heels. Mm. This one, they win by two touchdowns. They do not even cl come close to hitting the over-under, though, <laughs> but they do cover. I like it. I, I gave the Tar Heels, since they've hit 30 in each game and, and against a couple formidable-ish defenses like Minnesota, I'm going to just give them the benefit of the doubt until they prove me wrong. Giving Carolina up to 35, I'm going to have it 35-21. I feel better about my Carolina number than I do my Syracuse number. I think I, I hope that it's closer to year 13. But either way, I'm in the same spot as you. Carolina covers the nine and a half, but uh, the game falls just shy of that under over total hitting 56. So either way, Co and I have this going Carolina's way. Hopefully that is how things play out on Saturday. Very, very quickly, folks, let me run you through a weekend whip around of what else is going on in Carolina action. It feels like Every weekend, it's either everybody's on the road or everybody's <laughs> at home. This is another one of those everybody's at home weekends other than the women's soccer team at Duke, number 22 in the nation, on Sunday, 4 p.m. on the ACC Network. Remember, Carolina remains the only team or the only uh, school in the nation whose both men and women's programs in soccer are still undefeated. Of course, the men's team has like 89 ties to their name, so we'll <laughs> go with that. As for the men, they host Syracuse also today, Friday, 7.30 on ACC Network. Field hockey has another double weekend, but again, one in conference, one out. They host BC today, Friday at 4 p.m. on ACC Network Extra. And then Sunday, hosting Liberty at 2 p.m. on ACC Network Extra. Volleyball, another double weekend. Playing Louisville at home, sixth in the nation Today, Friday, 6 p.m. on ACC Network Extra. And then Sunday, hosting the Irish Notre Dame at 1 p.m. Also on ACC Network Extra. Uh, we know that the tennis has been participating all week in um, the, the ITA All-American Championships. The, the men are unfortunately all out. Uh, Fiona Crawley didn't, wasn't able to defend her singles championship from last year, fell in the round of 16. But... She and Carson Tanguilig, along with uh, Scotty and Reese Brantmeyer, are all in the quarterfinals, the Elite Eight, today, Friday. And so they'll be playing. And so uh, these ladies are kind of cruising towards what they did in the NCAA championships last spring. So best of luck to both those doubles pairings. Michael Coe, been great to have you on, brother. Thanks so much for joining us. we got to make this more of a regular habit. Great stuff. Thanks for joining us. Absolutely, Isaac. Thank you. Friends, that's it for today's episode and this week of Locked on Tar Heels. I want to thank you so much for joining us. You can follow the show at Locked on Heels on Twitter. You can follow Michael at Michael Cole, W-C-H-L. Co is spelled K-O-H. Make sure you get that. And you can follow me at Isaac Shade. You can email the show, LockedOnTarHeels at gmail.com for more in-depth conversation or join our Discord a great community of Locked on Tar Heels folks talking about Carolina everything under the sun. Don't forget to subscribe on video and audio format. Smash the like button so we know you're here. And we'd love to hear your comments on all the Tez Walker news and, of course, Carolina hosting Syracuse. Want to remind you that it's always a great day to be a Tar Heel. We'll be back with you on Monday unpacking this game and hopefully another Carolina win. But until then, peace.